It says we're live, but. Did you make it public? I did. Oh, you did? It doesn't show live on you either? Um, I don't know. You might have to go back and and uh, do public the way you set it up. Now, let me check. Okay, I think you're good now, actually. You're good. It's live. Okay. Um, it says you're good. So, you're, yeah, I can see it now. Mm -hmm. You can see it now on the YouTube. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Then we can yeah, start. I can now. Great. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. No, it's great. Um, welcome to Two Lines of Gods. Um, as you can tell, this was my first attempt at a live show and uh, feeling my way through it. I have literally no technical expertise at all in these things. So uh, Kyle's been good enough to help me. I want to welcome him to the channel. Um, I am very appreciative that he volunteered to do this. Um, I mean, I think he'll um, introduce himself. But he reacted to um, a recent video I did on Swinburg's Argument for God. And he's got some very, very interesting perspective on this. And um, what I'm going to do now is turn it over to Kyle. He'll introduce himself. You guys probably all know who I am. I'm just that sort of uh, simple semi-literate like lives under the bridge, and that bridge actually is on the avatar. And uh, we'll turn it over to Kyle, um, and welcome. Yeah, um, I guess that's should interest. So my name's Kyle Allender. I um, run the YouTube channel called Christian Idealism. My main focus is the philosophy of mind, although philosophy of religion is also very important because I think they're both connected. I think ultimately all philosophy is sort of connected, but mainly philosophy of mind. I do videos defending idealism, defending theism, right? Um, and I really, I try my best to look at both sides the best I can and come to a sort of better understanding of reality. So um, I'm glad to be on here and I hope that our dialogue can be a very fruitful discussion about these topics. I'm, I'm sure we will get some interesting ideas. Um, well, why don't you begin by, you know, responding the way you sort of did, you know, to me, and uh, we'll we'll just discuss the issues. We're just gonna, it's gonna be two philosophers talking about stuff. Yeah. So the first thing that I, I, I mean, there's a lot that could be said on your response to Swinburne, but I, I think the most important thing that could be said is the discussion about simplicity, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and you seem to deny simplicity in your blog. Like, I don't know. I don't, I'm just trying to like understand your view, but like when you said that simplicity is not a criteria, we should, I'm not sure if that's exactly your words, but it seemed like that's mm -hmm. what you're saying where simplicity was not a criteria we should be using in regards to comparing theism versus naturalism. Um, right. I, I I can address it. It's kind of a difficult area. But I just want to point out quickly, Kyle, that you're kind of breaking up a little bit when you move. I'm wondering if you might have a shift. Oh. You're breaking up a little too on my end. Um, it's kind of weird. Yeah. Especially like when you were out there, I just wonder if maybe there's a short and a chord. I'm a musician, okay. so I, I'm real familiar with shorts and chords. Okay. Well, my internet's fine. Um, it might okay. be your end, so could be. Um, yeah, simplicity is kind of, as far as I'm concerned, an outmoded concept. It comes from, I mean, the way that Swinburne brings it up 
is from, you know, going back to the um, medieval scholastics, assuming that this was a rational world, which reflect the national mind of a god. Um, 19th and 20th century discoveries and thought put the idea of this being a rational world into, into serious doubt. Um, that's a long conversation we have, but, um, I, you know, judging just from a lot of different directions, a rational explanation of the world doesn't hold up. I mean, we can start in the 19th century with Poincaré and um, his paper on uh, the four geometries, which showed that um, rational systems are somewhat arbitrary. He, he showed three different geometries um, that had, in fact, contradictory assumptions but were internally perfectly coherent and rational. And then he devised the fourth um, a fourth geometry that contradicted the other three and was perfectly rational. And, and, and uh, what that seems to imply is that, you know, rational constructions of the world don't really explain the world. Um, if we can get another point. Well, let's go on from that to um, Eugene Wigner, who I think you know, it was like one of the brilliant thinkers of the 20th century. He was also a mathematical physicist. And uh, building off of Poincaré, he showed that um, all rational systems, there, is, there could never be a rational explanation for the universe. All rational systems are bounded in space and time and the events chosen. And in fact, you could use different events within that space and time have an entirely different rational system, or you can propose different rational systems for the same bounded time, space, and events. For example, um, the Helio. Uh, Ptolemy had a, a, a geocentric rational explanation for the appearance of the night sky. So the Copernicus was... was um, heliocentric, and they both produced the, you know, the same predictions. They both could predict equally well, but they were entirely different explanations. And that's pretty much what all rational systems are. Um, and he showed the, the difference between Newtonian physics, Einstein's relativity, and, um, and quantum physics, all requiring different mathematics with different assumptions because they were bounded differently by time, space, and events. Um, and then you look at relativity, and there is no unity. There's not even unity of time to the universe. All, all time is in relation to something else and bounded. Uh, and you look at contemporary physics now, people like... Um, Carlo Rovelli or, or, or Roger Penrose, they show how time really it emerges from the um, vibration of mass itself. And as at the beginning of the universe, there is no, there is no time because there's no mass yet. At the end of the universe, things are so spread out that the, that the mass can't interact and there's no time. So time is really sort of a temporary or uh, existence. So there isn't a time, there isn't a rational explanation to the universe. And simplicity always seems to get disproven. As I showed through 19th century vision of Adam, and that, that was the fundamental ground of things. That was the simple explanation that, that predicted all chemical reactions. And then we got down to quantum mechanics, and we're well below quantum mechanics at this point in, in looking at, at uh, quantum field theory. And that just made things even less simple. And there's always this hope, well, there's going to be this elementary, this elemental realm that we haven't discovered yet that will bring it all together. But every time we go deeper, things become less rational, not more. So I reject simplicity. 
as um, a marker of, of truth in a hypothesis. Hmm. Well, that's interesting because um, I guess you made some points there, which I might have to think more about. But you did mention how um, how theories are sort of updated over time. So quantum mechanics sort of was the newer theory above Newtonian physics, right? It's not that Newtonian physics is wrong. It's just that it's incomplete, right? Yeah, it, it, it's, it, it describes one small bounded area of space and shows the events. Wigner called that the epistemological law of empiricism, which is any rational system is bound by time, space, and chosen events. And if you, and with any of those rational systems, if you start to expand those boundaries, it just sort of the whole system falls apart. And that's kind of what Kuhn, what Kuhn gets at in his paradigm shift. I always think of it as a metaphor shift. But science doesn't progress perfectly. You work within a paradigm or a metaphor until you stretch it far enough and it pops, and now you need a metaphor. And that's what we did. We went from atoms to um, quantum mechanics. Electrons went from, um, uh, you know, absorbing uh, the sun of, of the nucleus to a cloud because it doesn't have any one particular spot until you measure it. Um, so simplicity always breaks down. Interesting, because so it's in. I think what's interesting is how um, I wouldn't agree because I think that simplicity is a guide to truth, but it's not the only guide to truth, right? So what this means is like if you have a theory that can explain more, right, then we, we prefer that theory, right? And it seems like because Einstein's theory can explain more than Newton's theory, that's why we accept Einstein's theory. Not to say that Newton's theory is wrong, it's just that we, we it's sort of subsumed. Both. No, right, but what I'm saying is that they're – that Newton's theory is subsumed within Einstein's theory, right? So they're not incompatible, right? We still use them. It's uh, just I, that I, I, Einstein's theory explains more than what Newton's theory explains. I would put that differently. I would say that they are incompatible because they have different boundaries. Mm -hmm. Newton's theory works perfectly within that very narrow slice of reality in which we inhabit right works perfectly but it's a small small slice of reality einstein's theory works perfectly in the macro realm where relativity comes into play but it totally contradicts in its fundamentals with both newtonian physics and with quantum physics and you can't and because of that you cannot reconcile gravity in the einsteinian way with quantum gravity, They're two entirely different things, and the formulas cannot cannot be harmonized. They're, no matter how hard they try, there are still physicists who th who cling to the hope of a, a unified theory, and and you know that there is some rational explanation. But many other physicists say that Einstein was the last physicist who had a rightful claim to that belief. And he was proved wrong by by uh, John Bell in the '60s on, on that particular you know, idea of a yeah. rational universe. Well, so for hmm. me, simplicity is is not a good evaluator of the truth because it's usually either very very tightly bound or illusory. the The world just doesn't work according to the way. We reason. We developed reason. It was an adaptation that helped us thrive on the savanna. It took the world, which is not rational, which is hugely and comprehensively complex and doesn't even exist as the matter we see. It's, it's an interplay of a whole bunch of quantum fields. But we were able to simplify that, Sim not, not to determine truth. But for practical reasons, if we can turn these things into icons and simplify, just focus on those things that we need to manage and take away everything else and, and, and 
represented to ourselves as a rational order, tightly bounded, we were able to escape our, our prey and uh, our, our predators and, and catch our prey because we could look at a very simplified schematic and make plans off of that. Um, causality works within those type bounds. Doesn't work so well when you get outside of those, those type bounds. So I see reason as an adaptation in one of our two modes of knowledge, but the purpose of reason was not to reveal truth. In fact, it was to hide the complexity of truth so that we could feed ourselves. That's interesting because, I mean, so, I, I, okay, let me ask you this. Maybe we could sort of agree to this, that mm -hmm. a theory that has more scope, that can explain the most with the least, for example, mm -hmm. right, is more parsimonious. It's a better theory than one in which it has a multiplicity of commitments like basically, okay, let's 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 take a hypoth hypothetical scenario. Mm -hmm. You have one theory that has one commitment, one fundamental commitment, and that one commitment explains everything, right? Or you have another theory that has multiple commitments, and then it explains the same. Now, intuitively, we, we prefer this one, the first the first one, because it's relatively simple. It has, you know, or let's just let's just pick a practical example. Okay, let's say I walk outside and I see rain everywhere, like, or not rain, but just water, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, I could come up with two different hypotheses. Either one, I say that it rained last night. Let's just assume I don't have internet, I don't have table, TV, I don't know anything. Let's say I'm like back in the 19, like 1600s where like none of this technology was out. So I have to infer that what, what explains why everything's wet, right? I could go with the rain hypothesis, or what I could say is that um, it rained a little bit over here, um, someone sprinkled some water over here. Um, birds came around, just started spitting water all everywhere. So basically what I'm saying is it seems like the rain hypothesis on, on this particular example would be the better hypothesis because it explains everything with relatively simple commitments. Whereas the other one that I just mentioned um, doesn't really do that. It's more complex, right? Yes, but I would need to qualify that more tightly than you do. To be and uh, simplicity itself can sometimes lead to metaphysical conjecture that we can't really know. I mean, if we're going to, you know, really widen the scope and say, okay, I, you know, I, I put all this together, the simplest explanation is a guy created the world well i have no i have no direct experience of the god i only know the physical world going back to your example first of all it's tightly bounded in space and time so causality is going to work and in my experience i have seen rain i have never seen a little bit of rain here and bird spitting rain and stuff like that so i've got no no physical evidence that that would be a viable explanation, whereas I know it's going to rain. And so my two qualifications there is it's tightly bounded and it's limited to physical experience, not metaphysical conjecture. Interesting, because, mm -hmm. yeah, so because I mean, obviously, there's vast differences between a metaphysical explanation versus just an ordinary explanation. But I, but the reason why I point out the rain example is just to sort of clarify that we want um, a unified explanation for everything. Right now, you don't. It doesn't have to be God. Right? Yeah. Let me let me add one more point to that. Yeah, we all want a simple and unified explanation, which doesn't necessarily imply one exists. Physics is in a crisis right now because they always wanted to assume a rational universe that was governed by predictable laws and they wanted an elegant theory to explain it. And more and more theory, uh, physicists in the 20th century and into the 20th century even more are beginning to realize that no elegant theory is possible that would tell you anything true the world doesn't work that way. So 
I, I am the opposite. I instinctively am skeptical about simple explanations unless I can see the system in which it's working. By that, I mean going back to um, Wigner's ELE, where I understand the tight bounds of space, time, and chosen events. And within that, we can talk reasonably, we can talk causally. We go beyond that, and we can't do that anymore. So for simple things like, is it raining out? Yeah, um, I mean, those, it's, it's because it's raining. Yeah, I, I'm going to go for simple because it's within the ELE. Um, it, did a God create the world? No, I don't know. I, I don't see that. At all. Well, that's no, that's okay. That's that's maybe that maybe that helps clarify my sort of point because um, if, if if we're talking about metaphysical explanation, right, then we have to specify what we mean, right? So I guess I should sort of present my yeah. view of God, which is I'm an idealist, right? So as an idealist, I think that all that really exists is consciousness or experience, okay? And I actually, I'm glad that you sort of mentioned, and this might be something we can agree on that it seems like if we only want to posit first person reality, that seems to be more simpler than positing something beyond the first person, that person, person reality not to say that reality is like you know an illusion or something right but just to point out that it's it's more elegant in the sense that if we live in an idealist universe where all that exists is consciousness then i don't have to separate my experience versus a world that's beyond my own direct awareness right so even though there is a world beyond my direct awareness i just equate that or i just sort of say that the world that's beyond my direct experience is itself experience. It's just a different type of experience. Just like you have a different type of experience. I have a different type of experience. We have the same day. We all exist in the same first person reality. So we shave off, at least idealism shaves off the third person reality. So it seems like idealism would be the more elegant theory, right? If you're using the direct acquaintance example, right? Yeah, I want to go into that in more detail in a little bit, because I was going to ask you, first of all, let me make sure I understood this correctly, mm -hmm. but you're you're actually a, a panentheist? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah that, I think that's, that's my view of God, although I have a very specific, it's sort of like a, I can't, I don't even know the name, it's like this quasi- classic neoclassical panentheism essentially it's kind of my model god's for kind of takes time to explain but but yeah i found especially for christian i found that a very interesting position to take um and i'm, I'm not a panentheist but i there are some commonalities i have with panentheism um I think what we're going to disagree is on consciousness. And I'm certainly not an idealist, but I want to explore that a little bit later on. If we can just kind of hold that in our minds and come back to it in a bit. No, yeah. We really laid the, grand, the groundwork for it yet. I, yeah, I'm certainly not an idealist. Um, and we, so we should talk about what metaphysics is because we probably, I, I, my, I'm out of the German tradition. I'm heavily influenced by Nietzsche and Heidegger, especially Heidegger. Um, I taught Kant, Nietzsche, and Heidegger um, when I was a, gra you know, a graduate student. And I, I really take guidance from there. So my definition of metaphysics comes more out of the German tradition, which is slightly different from the analytic tradition, which I mm -hmm. suffered through for four years as an undergraduate. And um, here metaphysics goes back to its actual Greek meaning of it's, it's outside of physics. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's the new, it's, you know, Plato's, yeah, yeah. you know, and it's, it, it's not physical. We, you know, we experience the physical, but we could never experience the metaphysical. Um, the analytic tradition tends to confuse that a little bit and insist that ontology is a subset of metaphysics. 
and anybody who reads past Kant, especially into Heidegger, would strongly contest that idea. Ontology is is this is the study of what exists. And no, what right. exists is right in front of us. It's the physical and it's the metaphysical that I I dismiss. I see the last 200, 250 years of philosophy as the overturning of metaphysical thought and the demotion of reason from its privilege to knowledge. It started with Kant, he didn't know what he started in kind of, Heidegger says culminated in, in, in Nietzsche. But for me, we've got the physical world and it's all I can know. And it doesn't, it's not necessarily from a first person perspective because we are with other people and being with person, another person is very different from being with the chair. Um, mm -hmm. There's a consciousness that overlaps. So it's not necessarily first person, but I experience the world and all I can know. Now I can interpret it rationally or I can interpret it aesthetically. Those are my two modes of knowledge. And the aesthetic interpretation is far, far older and real than the rational interpretation, which is a recent adaptation. They're both useful in their own ways. And um, so that gets us to, when, when we think of the panentheism, the difference there between, I think, mostly is the idea that there's a conscious God and the idea in panentheism, at least usually, I don't know if this mm -hmm. applies to you, but usually panentheism is a God that infuses the physical world, but exists also outside of it, outside space and time, it transcends. And I don't believe anything transcends. No reason, I see no reason to assume anything outside of this physical reality that I'm in, to interpreting that physical reality is, is the challenge. So it comes down to this, um, is there intention and is there something holy? And I tend to believe in a sense that there is, but not in a conscious sense. Interesting. Um, you know, what Heidegger calls being is the essence of everything. Now, think about Heidegger, going back to that, he started out studying as a Jesuit. Then he renounced Catholicism, became a Protestant, and then he learned philosophy and became an atheist. But he never stopped asking the same questions. When I was in graduate school, I studied with a brilliant Christian philosopher named Paul Ricoeur, who was you know continental. He but he he was spent half of he was a part time. Uh, professor at University of Chicago, but mostly lived in Switzerland, and he, or was it France? Anyway, he said that on the continent, all the theologians read Heidegger and take him very seriously, and Nietzsche also, because they ask the exact same questions theologians ask, but they look for answers not metaphysically. And that's sort of, yeah. And it's it's kind of been my, so. Um, what what is their view of metaphysics then? Because I mean, it seems be, like metaphysics would be anything outside of the physical world, anything behind it. You know, metaphysics is what's beyond the physical. Um, Interesting. So wait, is it beyond but, what we perceive? No, or? no, no. We don't perceive all that much of physicality. That's okay. our problem. We perceive my my argument is we perceive much more aesthetically than we do rationally, but still we are our, our, our grasp at this point in the point of man is is is, is very primitive. Yet. But but we are think of it this way. You know, Heidegger instead of talking about God, talks about being, sign. This doesn't probably, probably just, doesn't work in English at all, and it works beautifully in German. Yeah. And sein is being, but it, it's also a verb. It's ist. And it, it is what drives and defines everything. It's the essence of everything. 
but essence isn't static. It's always becoming. It's things that happening. For 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 Heidegger, reality is always a happening, and experiencing those happenings aesthetically is what gives us insight into being, but if we get insight into being, we also get insight into our own essence because we are very much a part of being. And that's how we learn aesthetically or poetically, we we ruminate on the happening through experiences of, of being. But it, there's another important aspect that goes along with what you were saying. Uh, it has to do with consciousness. Being isn't conscious. We are. We're a much later stage of being in that we are, we physically, quite literally, are the consciousness of being. That's what we do, but we're very, very primitive. Um, the on, on my blog and on on um, on on, on uh, Twitter, I quote uh, a line of a poem by Heidegger. Wir sind zu spät für die Götter und zu früh für das Sein. Das ist ein angefangenes Gedicht des Mensch. What it means is, we're too late for that. Okay, the the Enlightenment killed our concept of God. We're too early for being because we haven't been asking the right questions, but we've just begun because the in, in the last part of that is we are beings just begun poem, which means being reveals itself to us and participates with us in happening to experience itself. We're a later, later stage of being, very early in that later stage. We're the just begun poem of being. So is there intention? I think, I mean, yeah, this is where I leave my atheist friends and my physicist friends, other than Penrose, who, who suspects there is, there is um, an intention. But it's not conscious intention. It's a built-in intention. In the essence. Part of that intention was to evolve consciousness, which is what our job is. Mm. Um, but I, I, it, I reject metaphysical explanations. That that's the tough part. And this is what Wittgenstein and Heidegger are one of the few things they agreed on. But it's remain silent before that which can't be spoken, which means no metaphysical. Resist the urge for metaphysical assertion. Resist the urge to oversimplify something that's absolutely incomprehensible. Um, so that's, that's probably the core difference between you and me. Yeah, so, okay, I just, one question. Did you see my video on defining consciousness? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so one of the things that I pointed out there is there is a difference between consciousness, right, just basically, and then mm -hmm. self-reflexive awareness, right? So, I don't know, maybe, maybe we could say that the being is conscious, but not in a self-reflexive sense. What do you think about that sort of idea? Well, it's, it's possible. It's, it's possible. I, but I, I mean, you know, physicists disagree on this too. There is a theory that consciousness is at all levels of, at varying levels, but throughout the physical world, mm -hmm. that even atoms have some sort of consciousness. That's the panpsychism. Pen yeah, that's that's the view. Yeah, but. and and I don't find it persuasive. But if I did, then I would go along with that. Yeah, being is conscious, but then there'd be no need for us. Um, I think consciousness is a late development of being itself. Well, it's, that's interesting. Yeah, because yeah. I could, well, I don't know if I would necessarily agree with this, but what you could say, at least on your sort of view, would be that self-reflexive consciousness is a late development. But consciousness itself, like what it's like to be something, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right, is, is just, that's just what the being is, right? And, and that, yeah... I, I don't know. What do you think about that? that? I would just have to say I don't know. Okay. 
But see, I mean, at least there's a there's a like a similarity there. Like you could hold that sort of view if you want. I mean, you yes. don't have to, but I, I but don't yeah. see anything that contradicts it. I just don't. See, I, I remember that part about being quiet before it can be spoken, and I have no insight into that at all. Yeah. But you know, I, I'm not saying that we won't on time either. Um, well, one of my huge interests is theory of quantum, the theory, the quantum theory of mind. I don't know how much you've gone into that. Yeah, I've, uh, oh man. So I guess a few things about that. So about a year, well, not a year ago, it's been like nine months now, but a while back I went deep into research about different interpretations of quantum mechanics, trying to figure out which ones are better, which ones are not. So one of them was the quantum mind theory. I think that's what it's called. I don't remember exactly what it's called, but so that the basic idea behind that is that quantum processes can be explained in terms of conscious awareness. And I'm not talking about like self flex awareness, just awareness in and of itself. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I do find that view to be plausible. Um, or, or I, I actually hold to a, a version of it, which is called relativistic quantum mechanics, where basically um, each each perspective, we all collapse the wave function, but only from our reference frames, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, so that's mm -hmm. that's the view I hold in terms of quantum. Yeah, I, I, I think there is something to that. Have you read um, the Penrod Kamaroff book? Mind? Not the book, but I am familiar with their theory. I think it's called quantum, what's it called? Uh, or theory. Or theory. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's kind to of me, weird. that's the most fascinating for two reasons. One is it's actually plausible. Hameroff showed that in the microtubules, the decoherence can be avoided, um, which makes it possible. But to me, what's really interesting in Pen is, is Penrose thought that we're all quantum beings and we interact through quantum fields like all other quantum beings. And that, in fact, consciousness is created at the moment of a collapse, of, of quantum collapse, that when we entangle with another quantum being, our quantum fields interact with the quantum fields in a, in a quantum way, causes wave collapse, or at least it appears to us that it does. And that, that is the moment when consciousness is created. It, it kind of explains wave collapse, um, and, and it also shows how we, you know, just how thinking itself can, in fact, interact with other quantum things in the world. That, that it is all connected. Um, I had a point I was going to make. I don't know what it was now, but to me, that mm -hmm. that is the fascinating part of it and, and and we know that in fact consciousness is waves because we that's how we measure it we measure it in alpha waves and gamma waves that's how we tell if somebody is conscious or not do they emanate these waves or don't they um and it's all just quantum fields interacting and the thing about that is we know that the quantum level of existence exists prior to space, time, and causality. I mean, we know there's non-locality mm -hmm. in the 60s. Um, there is no deterministic causality at that level, which allows for free will, which I'm convinced we actually have. In fact, I think everybody that's, actually... That's a point of agreement <laughs> between yeah. us. I, some people like to, to deny it. As Hawking said, I've never seen... Um, an adherent uh, of, of no free will not look both ways before crossing the street. Yeah. Um, but there could be a quantum explanation for it. I suspect. I actually, I would agree with that. Actually, that's. I mean, we, we can agree to that. That um, I think there is a quantum explanation for free will. So, um, so yeah. <laughs> but the funny thing about that that I, I look at from an epistemological point of view is reduction. Everything about our thinking other than aesthetic thinking is reduction. Our point of consciousness is reduction to an eigenstate. 
according to Penrose, and I think he's right. And then as we rationalize, we reduce even further. We go through our categories of understanding. We've reduced the complexity that we've already reduced from, you know, to eigenstate. Now we've got a, a manifold of eigenstate around us. And rationally, as a correlate on the savanna, we way grossly simplify icons that we can grasp and manipulate. But again, that's another huge reduction from reality. So we're two reductions away in rational thought. In aesthetic thought, we don't make that second reduction. Interesting. Have you, have you read the Brothers Karamazov? Um, no, but I guess. I should make a few comments about reductionism. So, okay. well, number one, I, 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 I wouldn't, I don't know if I would call myself a reductionist, but I am a reductionist in the idealist sense. So basically, I think that all of reality can be reduced to experience, right? Um, so again, it really depends on what you mean by reductionism. But I think ultimately, because reduction is about identification, right? So when you reduce something, you're just identifying what else it is, right? So I think that all of our, all of our experiences can just be reduced to experience, right? Um, and, you know, so on and so forth. But I guess the point is that I'm not sure, and this might be a point of disagreement, I'm not sure you can do it in the in the reverse where experience can be reduced to something that's non-experience. Because it's not like we, it's not like we see a reality of non-experience, right? Right. Um, no, we, we agree there. Everything in us starts with experience. Mm-hmm. Without experience, we, we know absolutely nothing at all. We don't even know we're here. Um, everything in our world begins with experience. Now, let me go back to something you said. You're reductionist because you can reduce everything to experience. But I think the more salient point is reducing experience to wave collapse and then the further rational reduction. Let me go back to, you said that you looked at various interpretations of quantum mechanics, which is another big interest of mine. Yeah. Um, the Copenhagen interpretation, which- That one's outdated a little bit, but- yeah, it, it summarizes how to calculate. Mm -hmm. They say quantum mechanics is a mathematical formula and it doesn't describe the world. It just simply gives us probabilities of quantum events and locations mm -hmm. of, of particles. Um, but it, it does not even attempt to to um, describe the world that it's predicting events in. It says it can't do that. Now, Bohr was hugely under the influence of Kant. And really took seriously the um, second section of the critique of pure reason, where he talks about um, you know, the, uh, you know I, I, the the dialectic, uh, where we run into um, transcendental illusion, as he put it out in in in, in the antinomies, and, and the point of that being, reason cannot legitimately be used beyond what we experience through the senses. And the implications of quantum mechanics, the Schrodinger um, equation, such that it, it implies a world that's impossible to our reason. There's non-locality, there's, you know, in space and time are gone, causality is gone, and the world we can't grasp it let's not even it let's just say it doesn't exist all we're talking about is a, is a a formula that kind of predicts probabilities and it's a good formula now that's a wholly unsatisfying interpretation and everybody has a problem with it yeah. but it's also it's also the only interpretation um einstein had his theory of his interpretation of incompleteness, he was sure that there are variables that we just don't know about and that um, and, and 
uh, if, we, if we did, we could unify it because nature is unified. God doesn't place with the universe. An entanglement cannot possibly be right because that means that either something in information is flowing faster than the speed of light. Which or it's outside space and time. Or it works another. outside space and time. And John Bell, I think, well, I think I, John Bell decisively proved non-locality in the 60s when we were finally able mm -hmm. to do those experiments. Einstein's incompleteness theory was wrong, but it was it was spurred by this need to understand the world behind the Schrodinger equation. And then we had Everett come along with his many worlds theory was an interesting guy. He wasn't even a physicist, and then he went off to make tons of money. But other people like Sean Carroll took it up and took it very seriously. And it's a fascinating theory. And, and with that, we have reverted to metaphysics. There's literally no reason to... No, yeah, I, I, I agree. With, I agree with that. Like, a lot of, like, multiverse theory and, like, parallel universes, like, those are not like scientific really scientific ideas i mean they're pure those, metaphysics yeah but that's the crisis that's the crisis of physics right now because we know that simplicity reason cannot describe the world as it is we can't grasp well, it. What, what, yeah yeah so what i'm i guess what i'm saying i guess this might be helpful because i i'm actually a scientific instrumentalist which means I do not think that scientific theories as they are today actually describe the total nature of reality, right? Mm -hmm. I think they're useful, right? Exactly. I think we can both agree to that. Certainly. But use, just because it's useful doesn't mean it's true, right? I mean, if you look at... Um, Which was my original point, by the way. Oh, then we agree on, on that point. So I guess my point is um, that let's, let's apply simplicity and explanatory power and apply it to metaphysical theories, and then we can go from there. Even if we can't scientifically show it, right? And so I think that's why metaphysics is important, right? Because science is only gonna bring you so far. It's not gonna actually tell you the ultimate nature of reality. So if you want to really get to the ultimate nature of reality, you're gonna have to use metaphysics, right? And I would so. say metaphysics will just give you, it will close off the truth just as reason or science shortens the truth. Um, can find truth and leaves the rest of the world unexplained, I would say that metaphysics will totally close off everything. And instead, we take an aesthetic approach to what we actually experience. And leave it there. let's not postulate gods um, or other things that we cannot possibly know beyond our experience. Let's just throw all that away. There's no compelling reason to accept it. Let's inquire into being itself, the physicality itself, and look for truth in there. And if there is a holiness, if there is an intention, that's where we're going to discover it. And I'll go back to what, what Ricoeur said. Heidegger asked the same questions as theologians, but but limited the inquiry to what was real in front of them. And, and to me, that's, there is so much mystery calling in this universe that we don't need to invent further mysteries. Anything we possibly know is going to come through experience. And experience comes through the physical. Let's bravely look at that more bravely than physicists do who kind of recoil and say, my God, God doesn't play dice with the universe. Well, as Hawkins said, you know, if there's a God, he, play, he plays dice with the universe and sometimes even hides the dice. We're not going to figure it out rationally. There is no simple, rational explanation for the universe. Now, some people leave it at that. That's what Wittgenstein did. Heidegger and Wittgenstein both drew right up to what they called in German, and they both called it the same word, das Mystische, the mystic. Wittgenstein said, we can't say anything meaningful about the mystical. That's what draws us. That's what draws scientists and artists and poets. 
that draws us. That's the mystery. That's what we want to know. But right, Wittgenstein said there's nothing we can say about it. So be quiet and let's go get the flies out of the bottles that uh, science, that, that philosophy has put in over the last 2,500 years. Heidegger says there's poetic language and we can, we can ruminate on experience poetically in understand in the more primordial, pre-rational aesthetic knowledge. I don't see an alternative to that. I really don't. I don't want to resort to metaphysics because I'm illusion. I don't want to stop at the at the Copenhagen interpretation, but I know science can't take me any further. Aesthetics is non-reductive. Unlike rational thought, it's all that complexity at once. That's why I asked you if you had read the Brothers Karamazov, which in my opinion is one of the three great novels ever written. The end of it is so overwhelming, it will scar your soul for the rest of your life. You will never, ever get over the ending of Brothers Karamazov. And generally, one of the brothers of Yosha uh, was also a monk. And he, there had been a horrible occurrence. It ripped apart a family, absolutely debased the good man caused death and, and, and suicides, and it was a horrendous, horrendous thing that happened. And then we also took all the kids who were, in, who, who were affected by that together, and there was an aesthetic happening. You cannot reduce the logic, and you cannot reduce the just simple words. It was a poetic experience of what morality is. If you want to know what morality is, Read those cameras off, and you will experience it at the end. And it, it's it, it 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 it's an essence. It, it, it's in us. We recognize that it's a part of being. Whereas all of the analytic philosophy, with their various theories of morality, are nothing. I mean, they pale in comparison because they don't really tell you anything. They talk before what can be spoken, but language can introduce us that into that presence, into that experience. And that's where I think that we need, I, I think Heidegger is exactly right about that. That's where we're going to find the holy if it exists. That's where we're going to find the intention if it exists. That's certainly where the mystery is. And the, the thing about that, was that aesthetic experience was the opposite of reductive. The analytic philosophy is reductive. It tries to reduce everything to propositional logic, which is just metaphysics. It won't tell you anything. Whereas the experience at the end of Brothers Karamazov was non-reductive. All of the complexity, all of the self-contradictions that are a part of reality were present and you, and, and you reacted to it. I'm sorry, I went way too long about that. No, no, no. Yeah, because my sorry, my dog was barking, but um, oh, we're we're very dog friendly here. <laughs> no, you're good. Um, yeah, so that's interesting. I don't know. It just it seems so like abstract the way that you're describing it because I I'm part of the analytic tradition now. Of course, I don't necessarily like to reduce everything to propositions, right? I mean, I think it could be somewhat helpful, helpful. But from my perspective, I mean, I'm just trying to build the best metaphysical theory I can using, you know, virtues, right? Um, so that's why, like, that was a part of what I want to do in this conversation. But it seems like you're going this other, more different approach, not analytical philosophy, but something a little complicated. Yeah, I, I, I had four years of analytical philosophy as an undergraduate. Well, Chicago was a mixture of pragmatism and analytic, and I thoroughly reject both of those approaches. Um, and yeah, I am going in a, in a very different direction because I, you know, taking Kant seriously and taking Heidegger seriously, I consider that our thought, a purely metaphysical thought is an illusion. It's a construction with no compelling reason to accept it. Whereas physical reality experience is a brute fact, it's right there. 
So that's what I want to inquire into, understanding the limits of science and rational thought. Which means I, well, I mean, I mean, I, I'm not sure if there's a limit to rational thought, but I, I do agree that there are limits to science, right? Um, well, how would I you rationally describe the quantum realm? Well, I mean, it depends on your interpretation. So I actually... Not metaphysically. You don't, if you don't resort to metaphysics or things we can't possibly know. Well, I mean, scientifically, we don't really have an... I mean, that's why there's so many different interpretations, because I think there is a fundamental problem in quantum mechanics, right? Especially with the measurement problem, right? right. Like that is... And that's why you have all these different, you know, interpretations, which could actually like each different... Well, not each one, but like a lot of the interpretations have different, can lead you to different metaphysical conclusions, right? Some of them lead to idealism, which is what I, you know, argue for. Some can lead to, you know, other sorts of views. Like I know Bohe mechanics, for example, might lead to a sort of like neutral monism or something. I don't know. But the point is that there comes a point where empirical methods have a limit, right? And so empirical methods have a limit. Um, if we're to take Kant seriously, then reason stops at that limit also. Um, you know, for Kant, the world didn't exist rationally. That's, that's, we have reason is an innate part of our consciousness. And it's evolved. And now Kant didn't know it was evolved. He didn't know about evolution. Mm -hmm. But, you know, from our perspective, we can, I think, safely say it's an evolutionary adaptation. And it's a way that we simplify the world into icons we can manipulate, but it's not a way to tell the truth. The world itself and, and quantum, quantum physics has taken us right up to this wall is that the world itself doesn't take place in space and time, nor is it explained by reason. It exists in ways that are impenetrable from that, from, from that direction. Um, which is why I say there's no rational explanation for quantum physics. And as Wigner pointed out, there is no rational explanation for the universe entirely and even Einstein pointed that out because there isn't any any universal time. There's no uniform time. Times are all local and, and, and relative. There is no no time. It, it just remind me of another one. I saw you say that in one of your videos that you believed along with Swinburne that God was temporal. But I, yeah right now yeah I'm a what would yeah. that even mean? Which which time? Your time, my time, the time on Mars. Carl well, yeah, I mean, it, it does get complicated. So I I'm kind of undecided on which theory of time I hold to. I used to be a B theorist, but now I'm sort of like undecided, right? Yeah, well, physics it kind of takes it, it sort of denies both A and B theory at this point. I mean, mm -hmm. Carlo Rovelli, he's absolutely fascinating. Oh yeah, I love yeah. I actually hold his interpretation, the relativistic okay. interpretation. Um, I, there's this, yeah, cause I played around, I don't know if you heard of this theory, it's called C theory of time. Mm -hmm. And the basic idea behind C theory is that instead of, there's no error of time. So on B theory or on A theory, you have, um, error of time and like only present exists on B theory. There is an error, but there's this block mm -hmm. right? on C theory. Okay. Right. There is no, there is no pointer. Like time is not going one direction. No, it's it, it isn't. If yeah. there, there are places where time doesn't even exist. Yeah. And so that view, I, I mean, it does sound compelling, right? Because I think that eventually when we come to an understanding of like quantum gravity, I think something like that is probably going to be the most accurate metaphysical perspective on time. I don't know. I could be wrong. But the point I'm trying to make is um, I, I would agree with you that, you know, time is relative, right? Um, and that the world, in fact, it's funny. Have you ever read um, Donald Hoffman? Yes, yes. I'm, I, I very much like his work. And, and, yeah. and that's kind of where I'm coming from, too. He, he's, he, he's, in a sense, a modern Kantian, although I don't think he's ever a Kant. Um, yeah. But that's, you know, he's got that fantastic analogy of the, you know, 
the computer itself is a bunch of zeros and ones mm-hmm. that just overwhelmingly complex. And our consciousness is the graphic interface where we have icons. And those icons don't exist, really. It's just mm-hmm. a way of representing the hugely complex flow that would overwhelm you in order, if purely for practical reasons, not, not to tell the truth. It doesn't reveal truth because it, it's an illusion. The icon doesn't really right. exist. But it's something we can grab onto. And without that, we, we wouldn't have survived the Savannah. And right. That, and it's, yeah. it's funny because I actually largely agree with his view of space and time, that space and time are basically constructions, right? Like they, yeah, they don't they actually, re- right. they don't and, represent and the true nature of reality. So even Einstein, because he had the B theory of time where mm-hmm. it, it didn't even exist. I mean, all the, even though, here's the problem. We can't even discuss it without using temporal and spatial terms because it's impossible for us to think rationally outside of space and time. So we think of this block where everything is simultaneous. So simultaneous is a temporal term and there's no time. And, you know, we just play out time. I mean, as far as Einstein was concerned, we play it out in our memories, but what we're playing out isn't time. It's really entropy or some kind of, you know, we're, we're looking at it, it piece by piece by piece, again, with a spatial analogy, and, and none of it is applied, so I can't think it. So I just don't. Yeah, because uh, the reason why I brought him up is just because he has a theory of conscious agents and yes, the basic yes, idea is that consciousness is the ground for everything and that and space then, and time is a construction of consciousness. So I don't know. What are your thoughts? On well, that? I think I don't follow him quite that far, although it does have a resonance with Penrose where, you know, it, it, it space, it, that's what, you know, it, it's that external yeah, you, Penrose was talking about consciousness is created at the moment of entanglement when the reduction takes place. And it's somewhat, you know, when, when you get to the bottom of, of, of Hoffman, there's some of that too, but I don't, I don't attribute consciousness to everything the way that he does. I think consciousness is something special in animals to vary okay yeah that would seem like a difference because i would say that consciousness is primary is the ontological primitive and then everything else comes from from that but yeah and i i just and i don't see anything in experience that tells me that i don't see anything in a rock heidegger has you know he talks about design and then humanity is Dasein. And what Dasein is, it, it, he, these are simple words, and it doesn't work in English. But Dasein in English and in German means being there, but it's also the, the common word for a person, Dasein. Um, and what that means is we uniquely have the consciousness of being there, caring about it. We understand that we are here as part of these other things that are around us and we're there and we're experiencing it. I don't see that. And to me, that's, that's real consciousness. I don't see that in a rock or in a photon. Um, I see it in us. No, right. And I'm not saying that I'm not a panpsychist, so I wouldn't say that a rock is yeah. conscious, right? Um, because a rock, I would say, is a representation. It's an icon, right? As, as Hoffman would say, it's an icon it's of certain, space and time. Is. Yes, exactly. Exactly it is. But it is still being. I mean, behind it, there is, there is being. And we can experience it aesthetically or we can think of it rationally. It, but I don't. You know, it, you know, rocks, you know, the wall in front of you it isn't really a wall. It's mostly empty space. And so it's a rock, mostly empty space. It's, it's a hugely inconceivable, complex interaction of the waves of quantum fields. And it, because it reflects 
light uniformly, we represent it to ourselves as a solid, but it's not, it's, 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 it's a field. Um, but I don't see any consciousness in it. But my point was when I'm with a human, it, it's an entirely different being with. Being with a rock or being with a chair doesn't have the same feel to it as being with a human. We, we suddenly are aware of other consciousness, mm-hmm. and there's an overlapping consciousness that I don't feel. And I feel it in, in, in attenuated ways with other mammals. I mean, I've got a dog, you communicate, and there's some overlap of consciousness, but it's not like what I have with a human. It's totally different. It's very, very limited. Um, but I don't think consciousness um, pervades everything. I really don't. I, I don't think there's consciousness in being. That's our job. So when you say being, is that like a, a neutral monus sort of view of, of philosophy of mind? Um, being is just the state of physically existing as it exists in its essence, its true essence, mm-hmm. our mere perception of it. Interesting. So I'm assuming you would say that a being is necessary, like it's a necessarily existent uh, substance or whatever? I don't think about necessary or substances. It gets into metaphysics, and I don't know what we're talking about there. Whether it's necessary or not is not something I can determine. All I can determine is it is. I can't tell you, and I'll probably never be able to tell you why the world exists or the universe exists, but I tell you it exists. Mm. Uh, is it necessary? I haven't the slightest idea. And we're, we've gone very, very late. Nick, it's this, I, it kind of brings up issues of Bayesian probability that we're not going to have time for Yeah, yeah. No, they're good. To, um, it's a good conversation, hope- though. <laughs> I hope you come back because we have scratched the surface. I don't know how you feel about it, but I think it's been a useful conversation. Um, and if you come back, I would like to get into the Bayesian probability and how Swinburne or intelligent design people in general have used that because I think it's hugely problematic. Um, and then finally, take this back to Swinburne, which was the original impetus of the discussion and we've hardly gotten to it uh would you be willing to do that um yeah in a few weeks we'll schedule another time yeah sure i mean whenever yeah um do you have anything else you'd like to wrap up with um no just we didn't really get too much into like i know we talked about simplicity but i guess there's some because you don't seem to, to accept analytic uh, metaphysics anyway, so right. that might be a big sort of distinction and, and, there. And also, because the world, from everything we can tell here in the early 21st century, doesn't work according to simplicity. It's usually complicated. And the more we learn, the more complicated it becomes. We went from atoms to Schrodinger's equation to quantum fields and, and it gets more and more confusing, and we keep finding more particles, and Fermilab just confirmed a particle that does not act according to the standard model. Which means there's even more complication. So a friend of mine yesterday commented that, you know, it, 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 the world appears fractal, and, and, and I think there might be something to that. Um, a simple Simplicity is not, as far as I can tell in, in my experience, simplicity is not a marker of truth of a hypothesis. Um, and, and I think Poincaré and Wigner long ago demonstrated that pretty decisively. So yeah, I would reject simplicity as any sort of marker of truth of a hypothesis. In fact, that would make me very suspicious Okay. Um, I mean, we've already gone over how the sign, the uh, philosophy of science and stuff, but um, we can discuss that more next time if you want more yeah, specifically sure, sure. about simplicity. Yeah, and then I'm hoping that we can 
actually bring it back to Swinburne in his argument mm -hmm. for the existence of God, because everything we've discussed so far is a necessary yeah. foundation for that discussion. No, yeah, because I think, I guess one last point with regards to Swinburne. Yeah. Um, so I view arguments very differently than most people. So I think arguments, although they're helpful, I don't think they're not, not to say that arguments are useless or anything like that. I think they are useful. It's just that an argument, any argument you give for any any sort of view or whatever is going to actually depend on prior metaphysics. So your prior metaphysical theory is going to determine, you know, any sort of arguments you make. So as an, I just a few examples, um, the Kalam cosmological argument actually assumes the a theory of time, and it also assumes causal finitism, right? Now, exactly, and that's its problem. Right, so that's my point, right? And it's the same thing for like Thomistic arguments, right? Aquinas is five exactly. ways, it assumes Thomistic. So my point is that when you're making an argument, you have to remember that any argument you give is going to depend on a prior metaphysical system, right? And then what you do is then you judge that metaphysical system using the theoretical virtues I talked about earlier, which is simplicity, explanatory power, and so on and so right. forth. Right, and, and, and I have those assumptions because they don't, they don't correspond to all the complexity and irrationality that we now know underlies reality. Um, so I don't see how simplicity is going to get us anywhere close to the truth. That's why I reject, I mean, medieval scholasticism is, uh, you know, this moved long ago and all of those, the, you know, the, the Thomistic arguments are only taken seriously these days by people on Twitter and some apologists, but no serious thing is, is, is spending any time on Thomistic arguments or the Kalam. Um, have you read Kierkegaard? Kierkegaard? Um, I've heard of him, but I've never read him. But I, I'm aware of his, I know you quoted me a few times, which is like, whatever you cannot speak of, you cannot like that's Wittgenstein, that's Wittgenstein. Yeah, we, oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> I, got, I get confused between the names. Kierkegaard was late nineteenth, early twentieth century. Um, he was a Christian, a very, very devout Christian. I think I have his book, Sickness and Death. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. He, his point, and I agree with him on this. He was, he was one of the few, just thoroughly honest Christians I've ever read. He says all religion is in essence irrational. That's just the nature of religion, which is also the nature of will in the world. It's irrational. Um, and all the arguments that theists have made since medieval scholasticism have been not only a waste of time, it's, it has sealed off or blocked off an understanding of what religion actually is. Nobody should be making rational arguments for religion because it is a essentially irrational. That belongs to science. And you have to make a choice. Are you going to view the world scientifically or are you going to view it religiously? If you're going to view it religiously, you need to give up reason. And I think he was, I, I don't believe there's a God, but I believe that if there were, you would have to do as God said and, and give up reason in, in a different way an experiential way, you know, the experience of the holy. Okay, so your your view is basically that the only way that belief in God could be rational is if you could actually experience. Yeah, but rationality has nothing to do with a belief in God. And I think apologists are seriously missing the point when they try to rationally argue for God. Um, I, I think the um, you know the epistemologist. I think Swinburne makes that mistake. He portrays himself as a natural theologian, invoking the scientific inductive method, uh, national cases for God that simply don't they don't hold. And the one major difference between Swinburne empiricism and that of science is science restricts itself to the sensible whereas Swinburne goes into 
to non-compelling metaphysical assertions and statements. Um, remember, Newton stopped short of saying what he is because he couldn't. He, he said, uh, you know, he, he gave us all kinds of measurements and relationships and gave us mathematical formulas for it. And then at the end, clearly said, but I can't tell you what gravity is. That you know, that's a metaphysical. No, right. Yeah. And, and I think this gets into Burn does. Well, I think it gets into the PSR, right? If contingent reality has to be explained further, you have to get to something that's necessary, and that's what I was trying to get across. I guess where you're going to have to stop at some, like your explanation can only, can only go so far, and you're going to have to stop somewhere, right? right? So, you know, I would say it's going to stop at necessity. So whatever is necessary, right, is that's going to be your stopping point for explanation. So, so yeah. And, and to me, I'm not sure that we ever know what's necessary. I think that's a, that if we go back to. I think, I think that would be good for, um, if, for our next discussion about sure. necessity. Yeah we've, yeah, we've got a long time right now. And I've kept you for an hour and 16 minutes now. So let's, we'll take a break here. And I certainly hope that you're able to come back in a couple of weeks and we can finish this off and then and, and more directly um, address the Swinburne issue, which I think, you know, is basically how we advertise this. Yeah, but I think the Swinburne issue is related to explanation, this is, right? This, yeah, this, see, this is the groundwork we have to lay before we can get to Swinburne. It just some okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining. And um, I've really enjoyed the conversation. Yep. Okay. Goodbye.